Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. In this episode, I have the privilege of interviewing a barber and a football coach, the co-owner of the Influential Grooming Lounge, Art the Dope Influencer Williams. One of the things we discuss is how culture eats strategy for breakfast. Yes, that's right. Culture eats strategy for breakfast. Now, what do we mean when we say that? Well, people, as employees, are usually loyal to the culture and not the business strategy. For example, people probably work for Patagonia because of the culture, not because they love selling sweaters or they might like packing shirts into boxes, but it's because they enjoy the Patagonia culture. Now, culture also creates a competitive differentiation. Think of it this way. When you think of Les Schwab tires, you always remember the individuals running out to your car ready to help and assist. They created a culture around that. That is now their competitive differentiation. Nobody else can go out and create a commercial where they have individuals run into your car ready to help service you because Les Schwab already created that. Same with Nordstrom. Now, I know a lot of other companies have phenomenal return policies, but the one return policy you tend to talk about most in business school is Nordstrom's. They created a competitive differentiation with their recurrent policy. Now, you can also use culture to create a strategy. One way to think about this is Tom's shoes, right? So Tom's, they use their culture of giving back to create a strategy. So for every shoe you purchase, they give a shoe back to a community in need. So think about it. Your culture is your brand. So when you're Going through and you're listening to this next episode, I really want you to begin to think about if what is your brand? And if you create your brand, what is the culture of your brand? Like Southwest Airlines, right? Everybody knows Southwest Airlines has great customer service, and that is very difficult to replicate. They have a competitive differentiation in customer service. All bags fly free. Oh, man. Everybody loves that. So when you're looking and you're going through this episode, I encourage you to think, what is your brand? What is your culture? And how would your strategy align with your culture? Thank you. And I hope you enjoy the episode. Welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. State University turned barber. He is a radio and TV personality on Rip City Morning, the Barbershop segment, and others. Please welcome the founder and co-owner of Influential Grooming Lounge, Art the Dope Influencer Williams. Art the Dope Influencer Williams, thank you so much for joining the Shades of Entrepreneurship. Now, first, let's let's uh let's introduce Art to the world. Please tell me who is Art the Dope Influencer Williams. Oh man. What, who is Art, the dope influencer, Williams? Um, well, I'm a husband, a father of two. Um, in the, in, I guess I'm in the hunt or I guess the hunt, hunt is the bad, is a bad word to use, but I'm in the mix for a puppy right now. My family is wooing me, trying their best to woo me to get a puppy. So I'm kind of in that phase right now. So I will soon probably be a pet owner as well. Um, Barbershop owner, barber by profession. Um, Basically, man, I'm really just an all around friend to everybody. I think Mm, I like it. (laughs) So what, what kind of dog? Well, right now they are looking at a um, Chihuahua blue healer mix. Mm. So it's not, not something too big. I actually wanted a big dog, <laughs> but you know, they, they want a little dog and, um, I will probably, will probably get a little dog. Yeah. I got a little people that I live with. Now. Yeah. Yeah. 
But yeah. hey, who's gonna make the decision though? I'm just gonna pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about the barbershop. Tell me, tell me, how did that start? Let me, I would love to kind of hear a little bit of background about you and your, your kind of upbringing, and then how did that uh, kind of turn into a, becoming a barber? Yeah. Well, I I grew up in Daytona Beach, Florida. Okay. Um, many years ago, I guess, and um, I used to work in a barbershop just mm. sweeping the floor when I was probably from the ages of 12 to 18 or okay. 19 when I fr- finally left. But um, I worked in a barbershop, man, just basically sweeping the floor. And I used to see at first what turned me on to being a barber was the exchange of cash mm, from mm-hmm. from client yeah, to barber. Yeah. Cause it's, I, cash. it's cash. Cause it's cash. It, yeah. well, it used to be now. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's a little it's different. Now. A lot, yep. Yeah. And he, uh, and a friend of mine, one of my best, well, my best friend since the third grade, his cousin owned the barbershop mm. and, um, me and my, me and this guy, we went, I mean, we did everything together, football, yeah. basketball, track. He was like, he was really my best friend. Nice. And, um, when we got into 10th grade, sophomore year in high school, his cousin talked him into going to barber school. Mm. And so while we were both in school and I was playing sports, he, he quit sports and then he went into barber school. Mm. So he became a barber before we even graduated high school. Nice. nice. And so that was the barbershop that I would go to every weekend and I'd work and sweep in that barbershop every mm. weekend from a little, like I said, from 12 years old until 18. And just seeing that, that exchange and how the conversations that used to happen in mm-hmm. the barbershop, the people that used to come through it, I mean, for the lack of a better term, you yeah. know, the boosters, <laughs> the people that with the hot, the hot merchandise. Yeah. And, I mean, you could probably get anything in the barbershop yeah. anyways, right? <laughs> but that was, that's what really yeah. drew me to the barbershop. And, and I knew when I was 15, by the time I was 15, I knew I wanted to be a barber. Mm. I knew that's what I wanted to do with my life. Uh, my mom didn't want me to do that though. Mm. So she had other plans for me. So yeah. I ended up going to college, but, but, um, after college, man, I couldn't wait till college was done. I mean, really? I cut hair all through college in the okay. dorms back then, you know, college, um, haircuts was, I mean, haircuts in the dorm room, you're cutting like $5 a head. Yeah. They, they get, <laughs> football players is coming through at 10 o'clock at night on their way to a party. Can I get lined up real quick? You know, That's so. funny. So, so where, where'd you play? Uh, you played at Portland state university. Yeah. I played football at Portland state university. I went to school in Santa Barbara, California first. Okay. Um, so I went from Daytona beach to Santa Barbara, California and in Santa Barbara, I ended up playing football at the junior college okay, or a community college in Santa Barbara with some friends from Florida and, um, just ended up, I, I mean, I guess I did pretty good for myself. Mm. I got a scholarship to Portland state nice. and I, some other schools that offered me some scholarships too, but I knew I wanted to work for Nike. Mm, and okay. so I found out Nike was in Portland. Okay. I was like, yeah. oh yeah, I'm going, yeah. that's where I want to go. <laughs> yeah. It makes sense. You know? So regardless of, of football, um, or what college it was, I was going to work at Nike. So, yeah. And, and I wanted to be close. Did, did, did that make, did you make it happen? Absolutely. That's what I'm talking Absolutely. about. Absolutely. And so now how did the transition go from working to Nike? Do you, do you still work at Nike or do you own the barbershop outright by yourself? How does that work? No, I'm a co-owner of a, of the barbershop. I have two business partners okay. that are clients of mine. Gotcha. So they're not barbers. They're, they're just silent business partners. Nice. They really handle a lot of the logistical stuff nice. you know, behind the scenes. Yeah. And I handle the day-to-day operations. Mm-hmm. But um, Nike, I, I stopped working. I worked at Nike while I was in college at, mm-hmm. at okay. uh, Portland okay. State. Gotcha. And once I graduated from Portland State, um, I moved back to California. Okay. So I quit Nike, um, moved back to California, and then I ended up coming back to Portland about two and a half years after that. Okay. And so instead of going to work at Nike, I just went to barber school instead. Mm, and, okay. Um, okay. I mean, and in the, even that story is pretty, pretty, uh, when I think about it and I think of like, you know, I look back and I think about where I, where I've come from or all of the things that yeah. has happened before I was actually able to become a professional barber. Yeah. Um, it's, I'm, I'm kind of in amazement at the road sometimes, um, the courage that it took to even do yeah. Yeah. You know, so, yeah. Cause you essentially went from, you know, C corporation yeah. to 
a sole proprietorship, LLC, right? Independent contractor, right? Entrepreneur, yep. Yep. Right? call it what you want, but you're working for yourself and everything you do, you kind of eat what you kill. Yeah, kind of thing, absolutely. Right? You know, how was that transition? How, was, was it a difficult transition? It was, it was a scary transition for mm, me. Yeah, yeah. Even in that process, um, I was working, I love watches. And mm. even though I don't have a watch on right yeah. now, but <laughs> I love watches. And, and I ended up getting, when I came back from Santa Barbara in 2002, I think it mm-hmm. was, when I landed back here in Portland in 2002, I couldn't find a job anywhere. So I went mm. to barber school mm. and um, going to barber school while I was in barber school, I eventually got a job at a watch store selling watches. Mm. And um, I was just a sales associate for about three months. And then they made me a uh, store manager at another store. Mm, okay. And so um, I'm working for this company and I, I think I may have worked there. I, I know I worked there the whole time I was in barber school. Okay. And that was at least nine months, maybe a year. Mm-hmm. And I worked there about two or three months after I finished barber school and got my barber license and everything. Right, right. But I was afraid to quit that job yeah. because it was a consistent, yeah. consistent stream of income. I had yeah. benefits, oh, you know, yeah. I had retirement yep. and, and I was getting a paycheck every two weeks. Mm-hmm. Like, no matter what, I yeah. was going to get a paycheck every yeah. two weeks, right? Sick and time, vacation time. All of that. Yeah, that feels good. That. Yeah. I don't miss the meetings, though. <laughs> this could have been another email. <laughs> you know? I, don't, I do not yeah. miss the Monday meetings yep. and conference calls every yeah. single Monday. Um, but I, I bought this book called uh, The Dream Giver mm. by Bruce Wilkinson probably a year before I even, before I read it. I mm. never, I didn't even read it. But- People don't buy watches every day like they buy shoes. Yeah. So the oh, watch store yeah. was really slow. Yeah. And so I just took this book to work one day and I just started reading this book, man. And it was all about just, just going from familiar, what was familiar to you, to taking a chance mm. and just stepping Getting outside out of that comfort unfamiliar. zone. Right. Yeah, definitely. And so when I got to the last page of that book, I closed that book and I said, you know what? I'm just going to be a barber. Put my two week notice in like mm. the very next day. Mm. And, um, and you know how corporate America is. Yeah. Like you put a two week notice in, they're like, well, you could just leave now. Yeah. You don't have yeah. to stay. Yeah. You know, <laughs> they're all, it, it seems like they're bitter. It but, does sometimes. I know? get bitter sometimes when somebody leaves me, man. I'm like, <laughs> man, what did I do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, they asked me to leave and I, and I was, I mean, I was ready, but yeah. I was afraid. I was so afraid to go from the consistent, paycheck yeah. and benefits to no benefits yeah. um, and an inconsistent pay. Mm. And so I just, but I took the plunge, man. I was like, yeah. man, since you were 15 years old, you wanted to do this. By this yeah. time I was 27 maybe. Okay. And so like between 15, and 20, that's 12 years. Mm. And so it took me 12 years before I became a professional barber. And by that time I was just like, you know what? It was only me. I didn't have mm. a girlfriend. I didn't have a wife. I didn't have kids. What do I got to lose? I've yeah. been poor before. Yeah. So I yeah. was like, if I'm poor, I just, I got to find a way to make yeah. it. <laughs> so did you, did you start out right away owning the, uh, owning your own shop or did you work for somebody else's shop? Yeah. I worked for somebody else. First. Okay. Um, and I don't know if you probably remember Reggie's barbershop was a big barbershop. Mm, mm-hmm. yep. it, it wasn't a big barbershop, but, but it was, was well known. Yeah. Yeah. It was, I think it was six of us in that shop, including Reggie. And, um, he gave me my first job out of barber school. Okay. And I remember him. He has <laughs> Reggie. I think Reggie used to smoke cigars. And so, uh, his voice was very raspy. <laughs> and I remember Reggie going in and talk to Reggie and Reggie was like, yeah, if you're going to work here, you got to, uh, <laughs> you're going to have to work here full time. I can't, I don't need no part-time barbers. Yeah. And I was like, shoot, man. Cause I wanted to try to keep my, your side. Yeah. My job. Yeah. Like barbers was going to be a side hustle kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. And so once he said that to me and then I got to the last page of that book, I just quit. I was just like, mm. okay, cool. Mm. I'm going to go be a barber. Yeah. And I, and then I could hear the echoes of all of the instructors in barber school saying, like trying to talk me into being like a, a cosmetologist, like you should oh, be yeah. a cosmetologist yeah. because you're not going to make, you're not even going to make $30,000 your first year out of barber school right, right. and all of that stuff. So I heard the stir of echoes mm. 
from their voices mm. even during that time. So it made it even made me more fearful to do it. But mm. I just felt like it was it just needed to be done. And if it I remember thinking, I'm tired of making somebody else rich. Yeah. You know, and yeah. I'm not rich at all, but I was like, man, I'm done making yeah. this other company rich who yeah. just asked me to go anyways. Yeah. You know what I yeah. mean? Like, totally. Makes sense. Makes they didn't sense. even really need me. Right. Yeah. So how did, how did that transition? So progress from, you know, working, working in uh, the shop there to owning your own shop or did, or was there a step in between? No, it, it, it actually happened that way. So I actually worked for Reggie, worked at Reggie's. We didn't, I didn't work for Reggie's. I was still an independent contractor in, gotcha. at okay. Reggie's barbershop. Yep. He just, pr- he provided the space for us. Gotcha. Um, another barber, me and another barber who I went to barber school with that worked in the same shop, we decided that it would be dope if we opened up our own barbershop together. So okay. technically the influential grooming lounge that exists today is the second barbershop that I co-owned. Oh, okay. The first okay. barbershop that I co-owned was called Champions Barbershop. Mm. And, um, so me and that guy, we just decided that we wanted to, we worked for, we worked at Reggie's for probably almost six years, I believe. Okay. And so it was just time for us to move on. You know, mm-hmm. you kind of stay in a place for too long. You kind of outgrow it. My, my, my clientele had gotten bigger. Mm-hmm. Um, Reggie's was still a pop in place, right. but we had visions of making the place more popping, you know? I gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. So we, we like literally moved six blocks down the street okay, and started champions barbershop and champions barbershop was phenomenal. Like it was, it was a, the dopest, one of the dopest barbershops in Portland. I mean, Northeast Portland is known for their barbershops yep. and yep. Geneva's. Yep. I always give respect to Mr. Paul Niles at Geneva's. Mm. And then you have Terrell Brandon's Terrell's, barbershop. Yep. Yep. And so when we when we came on the scene, it was like Geneva's, Terrell Brandon's, and then Champions. Yeah. And then and you know, and, and so we we built Champions up to what it was, always been community oriented. Yeah. Um and then that's kind of about nine years, I guess it was. We we opened Champions in two thousand eight. Mm-hmm. So it was five years I worked at Reggie's. I became a barber in two thousand three. 2008, we opened our own barbershop. Yeah. And um, here we are now, um, nine years later. It, it was nine years later. So it was 2008, we opened it. Nine years, 2017, I decided that I'm going to sell my interest and then just okay. go open my own shop. Oh, okay. On my own. So that's kind of how the influential became the influential. Well, that's when. Of uh, the influential started to come into fruition. Gotcha. And, and that actually happened for me because uh, I've been a football coach for a long time too. Mm, mm, mm-hmm. um, I had a, a friend that coached me in, at PSU who was the wide receiver coach at Boise State. Okay. And uh, he would invite me to Boise State every summer mm. to coach, coach their football camp. So it'd be mm, like nice. 300 kids. Yeah. And so that was kind of like my first little bit of coaching mm. um, was being at Boise State. But coaching those kids throughout the summer, it was like two weeks or something like mm-hmm. that. It was two different sessions. And um, I would spend that time with him just kind of learning stuff and learning coaching styles. And it was a group of kids that I had to coach. And in this group of kids that I coached for four days, I think it was, mm-hmm. they came to me and they were like, man, you're the best coach we ever had. Mm. And nice. um, not to kind of like pat myself on the back because I didn't know what the heck I was doing. Right. I didn't know what they were thinking. <laughs> you know, this X, this is X and this is O. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so they were like, man, you're the best coach I ever had, you know, and things started to just it. it I just remember when it was time to say goodbye to them kids. Mm-hmm. I was sad. Oh, yeah. And I was like, in four days, I got attached to <sighs> a group of kids that I'll probably never see again. Yeah. And um, and then. I remember driving home from Boise back to Portland. At this point I was married, me and my wife driving home. And I was like, man, the, the influence that I, that mm. the, those kids has had just as much of an influence in my life mm. in the four days that, that I did in theirs. Gotcha. And then the word influence just kept floating around in my memory. Like it right. just kept going influential, influential, influential. And, um, and I think in 2010 is when I discovered that like art, man, you actually have 
strong influence in life, mm. in the lives of young people. Mm. And you need to find a way to harness that. Mm. And so, hence, the Influential Grooming Lounge. It's, yeah. it's the longest name for a <laughs> business that you ever... Sinbad came in one time and Sinbad was like, bro, when you told me you worked at the Influential, I thought it was a strip club. <laughs> I was like, yeah, man, it's, it's a barbershop. <laughs> so let's, let's talk about that a little bit too. So one of the things that, um, you know, you've, you've actually brought in a lot of celebrities to cut their hair, Odell Beckham, Sinbad. How, how did that connection kind of, like, how did that all happen? Um, man, most of it just kind of happened through word of mouth, but uh, I made more money working for Nike on a photo shoot than I made working for Nike in two mm. weeks, you know? <laughs> Just, just fading them up. I like it, yeah. man. So, so a friend of mine, a client of mine, friend, a friend of mine, he he worked at Nike. He mm -hmm. was a, a, an art director at Nike. Okay, um, and he worked in the NFL division. Mm -hmm. And so, he always kind of anytime an NFL player came to town, yeah. I was a person he would call anytime they would have a photo shoot because mm -hmm. he was always the art director, or creative director on a photo shoot or something. Um, I would be the barber he he would call. Right. And then I just started to formulate relationships with these guys right. or friendships. I don't know what you want to call it, but yeah. um and we started exchanging phone numbers, which I thought was kind of weird at first. <laughs> I was like, man, like You want my number? All Adrian right. Peterson <laughs> wants to change. I'm, I'm like name dropping on this podcast. It's so no, bad. you're good. <laughs> but you know, we're exchanging phone. I'm like, bro, what like I don't have nothing to offer you but yeah. a pair of clippers and a nice yeah. shaved head, yeah. you know. But but um that's kind of how that that part happened. Like Nike, Nike probably I would say introduced me to the in, to professional mm. athletes. Well, gotcha. you know, working in the barbershop here in Portland, you get introduced to professional athletes just yeah. based on the trailblazers. Yep, yep. And so, and and at this point in my career, I am actually the personal barber of an actor, which I actually met through an old trailblazer. Mm. Um, I'm going to say his name because he still lives here, Martell Webster. Mm, yeah. And so I met Aldis Hodge through Martell Webster or vice versa. Mm -hmm. Aldis met me because I was the more famous person, <laughs> obviously. Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so we met each other and, 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 and that relationship just grew. You know, we're 12 yeah. years. We've been friends now for 12 years and now we get to, we've been working together pretty consistent for the last four years. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, Let's take it to the business perspective. Since you've you've done this twice now, what would you say was the hardest part about opening up your own shop? The fear of failing. Mm. The fear of being mm. a shop that nobody wants to come to. Mm. You know, and yeah. um, and just knowing that, just just feeling that, like even though you have a clientele, yeah. like I have a clientele. I'm about to open the shop and give at this point, like in at the new at the influential, we have nine barbers total. Mm. And that's including myself. So eight barbers, including myself. Okay. Um, well, let me let me rephrase that. We have seven barbers and two hairstylists. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. And um opening the shop, like I know I'm gonna survive. Mm-hmm based on the clientele that I have, like mm. I can survive. Gotcha. But knowing that I'm going to open a barbershop with eight mm. more stations, they're giving eight more people a job. Right. right. I have to be able to provide mm. a um, momentum or, or bring in people right. for them to be right. able to be successful as well. You're feeling the leadership now. So, yeah. So the yeah. responsibility of like making everybody yeah. successful, not yeah. just focusing on yourself is was yeah. big for me. That how, was nerve wracking. How has that transition gone pretty well? It has, it is going really well. I mean, I think everybody in our shop right now is, is pretty busy. Yeah. Um, some of them already, some of them had some clients, especially mm -hmm. the two hairstylists that work mm -hmm. there. They, they only do natural hair. So they do like locks and braids yeah. and stuff yeah. like that. So they always, they had a big yeah. clientele yeah. already. And then there's another guy, Terrence that works with us. He been he's been a barber in here in Portland for twenty six odd years, mm. and he um I met him when he worked at Terrell Brandis Barbershop. Oh yeah, okay. So he already had a clientele, but it was helping other people yep. build their clientele. Yeah, 
And knowing that that was going to, part of that would rest on my shoulders. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was a little nerve wracking at mm-hmm. first, but, but um, it's been good so far, you yeah. know? And, and then and even in that process, you're still, I realized that I'm still, I'm also an example for some of those guys as mm-hmm. well. Yeah. You know, like they're looking at my clientele. They're looking at me. Yeah. Like, yeah. Man, I wanna I'm going to try to get that to level. Yeah. yeah. So what, what do you enjoy most about the owning a shop? The people, mm. the people, the people mm. I work with. It's, it's, it's a really good job. It's, yeah. it's, it's amazing when you get to choose the people you work with though. Mm. Like no matter, it, it's not corporate America yeah. where you just, you take the most qualified person, even yeah. though that's what you really, you still want that right, in right. this industry. Right. But you know that you can see a person that's might not have the total skill it takes mm-hmm. and then say, okay, I can work with this guy and mm. help him help develop him into this barber that he wants mm. to be. Man. And so for me, it's that that's what it's been. And it's, I haven't had to hire too many people. I mean, you know, I got seven, seven other people, but it was, it's been, it, it's not been easy. I, I mean, I'm not going to fake the funk out like it's, yeah. it's an easy task, but it's, it's been the best part about it is really those people. And then the people, when you're hiring somebody, uh, when I get to hire somebody, I, I tell them my vision mm. for the shop. Like, mm. This is what we yes. want to do. We're going to be a community yes. shop no matter what. Mm. Um, the community is going to come first to yep. us. And, we're in the service industry. So our job is to serve, serve them, not always take from them, take from the community. Yeah. You know, community going to come to the shop. Yep. They're going to pay money to get a haircut. Yep. What are we going to do to get back? Mm. Mm. And sometimes it's free haircuts. Sometimes it's, it's free. It's backpacks, school supplies. Mm. Yeah. Sometimes it's yeah. coats, toys or whatever. But yeah. the fact of the matter is like, if you want to work here in this barbershop, mm-hmm. the name alone, the influential mm. name alone mm. means like, Right. means you more than just a name. Up. Yeah. Yeah. You signed up for something more than just a haircut. Right. Yeah. And I think, I think you mentioned something that's really important to highlight. And for those listening at home is culture, each strategy for breakfast. You know, mm. if you not, if you're not hiring folks that align with your culture, and I think it's really important what you're doing is, is putting your culture out front. Hey, this is what we believe in. And if you don't believe in this, that's okay. Mm-hmm. You're just not for us. Absolutely. And that's okay. We, we can, you can find a different shop by all means. But this is who we are. Yeah. And I think that's so, so important. You know, and one of the things you've also been talking about is, is your community work. I would love to kind of hear, let's get into that a little bit. So you, you're out in Northeast. What all have you, you've also, um, you're the, the coach at the Westland, I believe, yeah. Westland High School Football. So mm-hmm. let, let's talk about that. How, how did it all start? Uh, start? Um, I mean, every everything for me pretty much, for the most part, started in the barbershop, mm-hmm. you know, uh, it, and, and I mean, golly, man, the barbershop is probably the, <laughs> the foundation of my life, really, yeah. uh, to some degree. Um, but even football coaching started in the barbershop. A client came in, mm. already, he he took a job somewhere else. They offered him the job. He took a job somewhere else. Mm. And then he said, art would be a good fit for this. I interviewed mm. for the job, and they gave me the job. And even in football, like, I love football. Yeah, um, It's what I've what I did for a long time, but mm-hmm. I I also understand that football is just a secondary mm. thing in life as mm. well. Yeah, and so even with with coaching, and I I told this story to somebody the other day, like on Mondays we had film Mondays. Mm. I, I coached the wide receivers, so we had film Mondays as a group, as a wide receiver group, and in and instead of watching film on Mondays, we always told the head coach that we watched film. It was like our little secret. Right. All of our receivers in this room for on Monday for an hour and 15 minutes, all we talk about is life. Mm. Like I don't no yeah. football. We don't yeah. even we don't discuss yep. football. But when we leave this room, coach, coach thinks the head coach thinks we just talked, we just watched yeah. <laughs> You know. Hope the head coach ain't listening. Right. <laughs> no, that's important though. I think it's important for these individuals, you know, especially the the younger generation, you know. When I was growing up playing football, um, one of our coaches had this thing called the Virtue First Foundation. And it really was talking about us being okay, saying, hey, I love you. I care for you. I, yeah. I want to hear about your emotions, you know, and talking about your emotions and being able to do that freely with with one of your comrades, you know, right there yeah. in pads. That wasn't true, you know, 20, 30 years ago. 
right. know, and, and now it, it seems to be, we're making it okay. Mm-hmm. It's so important, you yeah. know, it's so important. Now, when you're thinking about that, how do you, how do you build the team? Both, not only in your barbershop, right? How did you create your team, right? But how do you envision like your players? Like, how do you build them up? Um, well, once I develop that personal, once they've allowed me in personally, mm-hmm. and, and and normally what we do, we always keep everything that happens in that room stays in that room. Yes. You know what Trust I mean? Trust is like, important. We don't talk about it yeah. outside of the room we don't talk about each other's business and all that kind mm. of stuff. Everything is shared here. And yeah. so we built that trust with each other. And so now once I get on the football field, cause what I was taught as a coach, the first thing he told me is if a kid cares for you, if a kid mm-hmm. knows you care for them, mm-hmm. they'll do anything for you. Mm. They'll, they'll run through a brick wall for you. Yeah. And, and it's, so in some ways it sounds like manipulation, mm. but kids can see through BS. <laughs> so they know if you really care for them yeah, or if you don't care for yeah. them. And so for me, I've always taken that approach because it was because I grew up with a single mom and, mm. sing, you know, me, my sister, we, it was just me and her. And then eventually my mom got married and we had a stepdad and mm. a brother, another brother. But for a long, long time, all mm. of my morals and values was instilled in me by mm. a single woman, yeah. a single, a single mom. And so there was coaches that mm-hmm. stepped up as a father figure for me. They didn't, you know, mm-hmm. they weren't my yeah. dad, but yeah. they, yeah. they yep. stepped in that place, yep. you know, that my uncles couldn't feel that my right. dad couldn't feel. And so I wanted, I knew as a coach, because that's what I experienced. Mm-hmm. That's what I wanted to be able to give to other kids as well. Mm-hmm. Even kids that have mm-hmm. two parent homes. Right. Right. And some of those kids would have two parents at home. Mm-hmm but have never got a hug from their dad mm, mm. or never gotten a hug from another man yeah. that didn't have any intentions, mm. but to love them. Right. And so that's kind of where I came into play for, mm. a, lot of, for a lot of those kids who have in unlimited resources, yep. Yep. but the ultimate resource they ever really wanted was love from. A yeah. Father. Yeah. And I'm sure grew in, you know, you growing up, um, you know, building the barbershop, you probably felt some adversity and some doubt yourself. How did you kind of handle those situations? You know, man, my wife was big mm, for me. Yeah. Um, believe it or not, like there was times where I would come home and and I would just be like, I don't know if this is the right thing for yeah. me to do. Yeah. Or if I want to do this anymore. Yeah. You know, and I could easily I got a college degree. I could easily go probably work somewhere else. I mean, right. I'm sure I could go back to Nike and sell shoes if I wanted to, yeah. or something yeah. like that. And uh it was her that always kept saying to me, it's going to be okay. Like you just got to weather. She was the first person because I, I used to stress a lot. Something brings me anxiety or makes it uneasy for me, Uh uncomfortable for me. I used to like go bananas trying to, and I remember one day I was worried about something and we were standing in line at subway and she said, suck it up. We were probably only married (laughs) for like two years. She was like, suck it up. Art is not that bad. Like yeah. you'll get through it. Yeah. yeah. And so ever since that day, it's always been anytime I come to her, not anytime now, but when I was in the process of opening a barbershop or running a barbershop mm-hmm. or trying to build a team or whatever I was doing, she was always that person. Mm-hmm. She was that cheerleader. She was mm-hmm. also that coach that would be like, you'll get through this. Like, yeah. It's not that hard. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so um, I would definitely give give the credit to her for helping mm. me stay the course because there's been plenty times in this business or just being an entrepreneur that I've been like, man, it's so much easier for me to just go work for somebody else. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. I get benefits working for somebody else. Yeah. I get retirement working for somebody mm-hmm. else. Like I could just do that and yeah. not have to worry about managing yeah. seven other people or eight other people. Yeah. Not, not have to man not have to worry about supplying a barbershop yeah. or or creating a space, a safe space for everybody. Mm. You know what I mean? Like yeah. just that pressure or trying to entertain the community. Right, right. You know, I could just go work at Starbucks and then yeah. talk, talk Starbucks into serving the community. Mm. Yep. You know, but yeah. but she was like, no, nah, that's not you. That's not you. <laughs> yeah, she knew. Yeah. So what, looking back on some of this, what, what do you, th- what do you kind of wish you would have avoided? What are some like mistakes you may have made that you wish you'd avoided? 
Um, probably moving too fast sometimes. Oh, okay. I used to be okay. very calculated in the things I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. And so I'll see this big, like I could see the end road, mm-hmm. but then I missed the little steps it takes to get to the end. Mm, yeah. That attention to detail. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and sometimes I'm just like, man, how come, like, why can't we just do this? Yeah. yeah. And then it's usually my wife that will say, mm. well, these are the things mm. that it'll take to yeah. actually get to that point. So like when you asked me about this podcast, that's why I was yeah. like, you should probably just email Patricia, because she, she, <laughs> she'll, 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 she'll make, make sure, sure I'm there. Yeah. So what keeps you motivated? Man, the fact that I look at every day, I look at six sets of, or three, mm. three sets of eyes mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that believe in mm-hmm. me more than anybody in the world does. And um, it, it just kind of, it just energizes me in those days where, I don't feel like getting out of bed and, yeah. and, 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 you know, and also I think that the athletic part of me, the athlete part of mm. me also feeds into that because I'm like, man, I remember these days. Mm-hmm. I remember there's not a day, there's not many days that I have that's not similar to uh workouts or, yeah. or those days, those mornings when we had off season workouts and you got to get up at mm. five o'clock in the morning to be at, to be at the gym at five 30 mm. or something like that. So, um, but my family definitely yeah. motivates me. And then, the, and then the fact that I see those eyes because those eyes are in my house. Right, right. You know what I mean? Right. But, but then the moment I step outside, I see millions and thousands, mm. thousands of other eyes yeah. that I'm like, man, I work this job. This, it's not even a, really a job, but I work this job for them too. Mm. For each yes. person that sits yes. in my chair, yeah. I'm like, man. Yeah. We get an opportunity to, I get an opportunity to learn from them. Mm-hmm. They get an opportunity to yep. maybe learn from me. And then on top of that, I get to help them with their own self-esteem. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and I don't know what it is. You know, I've heard stories. I, I There's a story of a kid who disappeared when I worked in my first ever barbershop mm-hmm. when I worked at Reggie's. He came in and I didn't, I didn't even remember this until he reminded me. Mm-hmm. But he said, I see he disappeared for like four years. Right. And I didn't think anything of it. Mm-hmm. I was just like, then he shows up in, um, champions barbershop when I was working at champions. Mm-hmm. And I was like, bro, where you been? Yeah. And he goes, man, I went to college. And I said, what? I went to Clark Atlanta. And I was like, that's dope, man. And he mm-hmm. was like, well, you, you were sitting, you were sitting in your chair. I was getting a haircut. Um, somebody else was cutting his hair. And he was like, and you kept saying, you said to me, to get my education. Like mm. that's going to be important for you mm. in the long run, like for, for us in the long run. And granted, I could have been a barber without going to, I, I didn't need to go to college. Mm-hmm. I could have just went straight to mm-hmm. barber school and become a barber, but that's not what happened for me. Yeah. And so I went to college and got an education. And he said to me, it was a conversation we had in a barbershop wow. four years ago that made me go, you know what? I'm going to go to college. You know, it's, it's, it's incredible how we as people don't understand sometimes how much we influence somebody else based on our words. And that that's true. Even our, our hateful speech. So individuals at home listening, you know, yeah. it's important to lift each other up, manage each other up, you know, but in this instance, you know, my Angelo once said, um, they may not remember what you said or did, but they will always remember the way you made them feel, Yeah, you know? And I think this is one of those moments, right? Where you really just changed individuals life. Now, you know, what, what influence or advice would you give the younger generation? You know, now that you're in your position, you've owned two companies, um, you, you worked at Nike, you've, you've gone to college, right? You played football, you've, you've been, you know, hang out with celebrities. You've done a lot of different uh, things in your life. What influence would you give them not only about their career, but about how important it is to network with other people? Um, I would just tell them always be yourself, but, but understand being yourself in order for you to be yourself, you got to know yourself. Mm, and so yeah. we hear people say all the time, yep. oh, I'm just going to be me, you know, but to everybody in this room, you are rude. Mm. So is that really mm. being you? Like is, 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 do you know who you are? Yeah. Because if you knew who you are, you'd know, you'd be able to decipher or figure out if you, what you were doing or what you were saying is rude or not. Like there's some people that just completely, are like, 
I'm always 100. Yeah. And sometimes 100 is real stupid. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm. And so, and so for me, I would, I would always get the advice I would give anybody, especially young people, man. Cause if young people can get this mm -hmm. early, mm -hmm. I think it might save them a lot. Yeah. And there's two things in this world. You can never get back the time you waste mm. and, and the words you say. Mm. And so make sure that the time you have, you, you do everything you can to make that time yep. count. Yep. And then the words don't waste words. Mm. Don't waste yes. words, tearing people down. Yes. Your job is to build people up. Yes. Because at the, at the beginning of the day, when you look in the mirror and you're brushing your teeth, mm -hmm. if you actually speak to yourself, whether you speak to mm. yourself out loud or mm. you speak to yourself yeah. inwardly and you tell yourself good things about yourself, it, good things will manifest. Yep. Yeah. And so I just let everything. So, and, and then let everything happen organically. You don't always have to have an, an intent for a relationship mm. or for something. You yeah. know what I mean? Everything doesn't have to have a goal attached to it. Yes. Yes. That's very you true. Know, it just, can, it can just happen, you mm. know? And, and I mean, that's the very definition of or, organic. It just, it just kind of just happens. Yes. Like, yeah. You know, and, 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 I mean, maybe you're intentional about planting the seeds you plant, like the words you speak. You're mm -hmm. intentional about the words you speak and in the time you you give or the time you you give serving and things like that. You're intentional about that, but mm -hmm. but your only goal is to enhance the life of another person. Man, yeah, you know. So so now now we're here. Let, let's think about let's think about art. Looking back, what advice would you give yourself, your younger self? Man, that same advice. Um, <laughs> that's the easy answer. Um, I would definitely, um, I would tell myself, man, just go. Mm. You know what I mean? Just go. Like, yeah. it's a long road. It's a long road. And it's okay if you slow down. Mm. But don't stop. I would mm. tell myself, don't yeah. stop. Man, it's a long road, bro. Like, yeah. it's, 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 there's no shortcuts. Yeah. You know what I mean? There's, there's, there's not going to be anything easy. If it's, if it's worth it, it's not going to be easy. Right. Yeah. And so if you just keep walking, if you just keep moving, slow down all you want to, but mm. just keep moving. Yeah. You're going to be all right. Yeah. Nice. Now tell the people at home how they can find you. How, where's your shop at? Social media handles. Yeah. All that, huh? <laughs> um, well, I'm at the influential grooming lounge mm -hmm. on 3262 Northeast Martin Luther King Boulevard in Portland, Oregon. Um, man, come through. You can check us out. You can, uh, go, you can Google us. You can look us up, um, on the web, the influential grooming or the influential gl.com. You can book an appointment that mm -hmm. way mm -hmm. with all eight barbers and nice. hairstylists that we have. You can, you can find us there. My, uh, Instagram handle, my personal Instagram handle is the dope influencer. Mm -hmm. Um, my, my barber Instagram handle is influential barber mm -hmm. and in the barbershop um is also at at the influential gl mm, man art thank you so much for coming on the show yeah. the sage of entrepreneurship tonight thank you for tuning in to the shades of entrepreneurship for more information please follow the shades of e on twitter instagram facebook or visit the shades of e.com